You had an enjoyable break. Lots of networking. I think uh, I think networking is almost as important as some of the uh, some of the business and econ discussions that happen at the front of the room. So we tried to build that in. I think every conference planner plans to build in lots of networking time, but then speeches run long. Too many people are on stage, and it doesn't happen. So so far, I think we've managed to to hold to it. So uh, glad you're all able to be here for this. So uh, the morning session, we got to hear um, from the uh, from the organizers for the program and uh, Dr. Ramesh Wadwani and the Wadwani Foundation, um, our terrific friends Tian Nainan, Tarun Das, Kiran Pasricha from the Ananta Aspen Center, uh, uh, Dr. John Hamry here at uh, the Center for Strategic International Studies. Um, and so now we'll transition a bit, and I think for the morning session, to hear also some of the things that the Indian government has been doing, um, both to open up and, uh, and to get the economy rolling again. And uh, we couldn't have asked for, I think, somebody better to set the table on that than the Finance Secretary, uh, Mr. Rajiv Marishi. Um, you probably have heard of Mr. Marishi. Uh, he has uh, built up quite a reputation, I think, uh, both uh, his work at the state level uh, from Rajasthan and the work that he did under Chief Minister Vasundar Raje, but also immediately after uh, moving to, uh, to Delhi and taking over as Finance Secretary in October 2014. Um, we've seen a, a lot of work coming out of the Ministry of Finance. Um, between the budget, between getting critical reforms like the insurance bill passed through Parliament. Uh, it has been a time of much activity. Um, so hopefully, even though you're on travel, jet lagged, and speaking at many different events, you look at this as a bit of a reprieve <laughs> from all the tremendous things you've been doing while in Delhi. So Secretary Marishi, I invite you up to the lectern here, sir, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rick, for your kind words. And thank you, CSIS, for having me here today and giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's never easy to fit, you know, fit into another person's shoes. And I believe I'm filling in for N.K. Singh, who's not here. And N.K. Singh's shoes are actually quite large. So I don't know whether I can fit them, but I'll try to do some justice to them. The advantage, I, of course, I have of uh, filling in is that I can choose to ignore the topic given to me. <laughs> and so I don't have to pretend I know things about the topic. And uh, so I've decided to actually talk today to you about uh, an area which not very many people understand very well in India. So obviously I'm quite sure that very little understanding of it is uh, available in the United States. But as people who want to engage with India, or who are engaging with India, I think knowing this part of India is also important. So I'll speak to you today about uh, fiscal federalism and fiscal relations between the center and the state in India, and how it impinges on prospective investors who have to work in India or who are working in India. As I said, this is a area that not too many people understand in India also. So I hope if I bore you, please raise your hands, I'll stop. <laughs> well, like most countries, uh, India also has a three-tier structure, like most many countries. So there's a central government called the union government, there are state governments, and there's a third tier of the local governments. Today I'm going to concentrate and tell you about the first two tiers, there's the central government and the state governments, and how their relationship uh, is structured and how it is now evolving in very meaningful and interesting ways. And this evolution is taking place, uh, has uh, sort of picked up speed in the last couple of years, last two, three years, and is showing up in very different uh, 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 sort of actions and recommendations and developments. So the work is divided between the state and the center by the constitution. Uh, the tasks given or the powers that the central government can uh, exercise are in what is known as the central list. And what the states can do is known as the state list, including the areas where they can tax. So there's some taxation powers which are devolved to the states, notably it's a sin tax like tax on liquor, and also tax on sale of goods. It's important that you note this because I'm going to talk about GST too. So 
tax on uh, sale of goods is also with the state. There is also a third list, which is known as the concurrent list, which is unique to India, where both the state and the center have concurrent powers. And, but the Constitution provides that should there be legislation, by, and both the center and the state can legislate, but the Constitution provides that should there be legislation by the center, then uh, the center's law will prevail. And it's important that you note this also, because I will refer to the state's yearning for change by referring to the example from Rajasthan of labor reforms, which are in from the concurrent list. And they impinge heavily, as I said, on investment and investors in, in, in India. The revenues collected by the central government are the major revenues of the, of the country. They include custom duties, excise duties, service tax. So they are major, the major revenues collected by the center. And therefore, the Constitution also provides in Article 280 that the revenues collected by the central government would be divided amongst this, between the center and the states, and then amongst the states. <coughs> so there's the Article 280 of the Constitution of India provides for setting up a finance commission every five years and uh, recommend the division of fiscal resources between the center and the states and from the share of the states amongst the states. We've had recently a report of the 14th Finance Commission, which has been implemented in great part. And this is also to be noted because I will refer to this also in a short while on how it has affected the balance of power between the center and the states. To the credit of all the governments in India from 1950 onwards, the recommendations of the Finance Commission, though they are recommendations and therefore technically rejectable or acceptable, but it's to the credit of all the governments in India, central governments in India, that from the first of the 14th Finance Commission, no major recommendation of the Finance Commission, especially recommendations regarding devolution of taxes, has ever been tinkered with. So that is uh, a maturity shown by the central government that it has treated the uh, recommendations of the Finance Commission as an award. <clears throat> now, I will talk now, therefore, this, having given you this background of the scheme of things, I will talk to you about now three developments that have taken place that are evolving now and which impact uh, the politics of the country and impact economic activity in the country. The one, of course, is uh, the often talked about introduction of GST, the general sales tax, because till now, because of the constitutional scheme of things, you have to pay a tax to the central government, you have to pay taxes. To the center, you have to pay taxes on, for example, imports, on service tax, and also uh, tax on manufacturing, known as excise duty. And in the state, you have to pay tax on sale of goods that tended to have a cascading effect on the taxation, uh, on the tax uh, incidence on the goods and make it more expensive. And it also meant uh, a harrowing piece of paperwork involved in not only meeting requirements of two tax authorities, one in the center of the state, but actually of 28 tax authorities, because each tax authority in the state had its own sort of rules and laws to deal with tax on sale of goods. So the uh, GST is an idea which is to amalgamate the two taxes. It is being done by building consensus. There is no, uh, there is no constitutional provision where the central government can impose this on the states, and therefore it has to be done by consensus. And uh, it has been under discussion now in various ways 
for nearly a decade, less than a decade, but almost a decade. And again, it's an ode to the maturity of Indian politicians that they have an agreement in place. And as a consequence, Finance Minister Jaitley has introduced uh, in the parliament this year an amendment to the constitution to allow for the amalgamation of these taxes. What, in, in short, what is happening is that the states have now agreed basically to give up their absolute power on imposition of tax on sales of goods, which is a very important development uh, from the, both from a political point of view and an economic point of view. So GST is likely to be introduced in India, uh, hopefully, in the next one year. It will take a year because the Constitution Amendment requires both houses to pass it and then ratification by half the states. It will take time and then there has to be a law for GST thereafter enacted under the new constitutional provision. It will take time but we hope to have it in place as announced by Finance Minister Jaitley by the 1st of April 2016. This development should make doing business in India a little more attractive and simpler and contribute to the ease of doing business in India. It will also create difficulties uh, in getting changes in uh, incidence of taxation because instead of going to a state government and changing a, changing a tax rate or central tax rate by going to the government of India as finance minister, now it will have to go through a process of consultation with all the states. So it will also make, therefore, a tax regime in India more predictable, predictable because it won't be so easy to change it. The second development that is taking place, place is the assertion of the states to not abide by the laws that the central government enacted and has not changed for years. The example I need to take, that I need to mention here, is uh, the uh, much talked about in India reforms in labor laws, which Rajasthan carried out last year. So those, the reforms that Rajasthan has carried out in four laws, labor laws of India, four different acts, are actually in contradiction to the central law. And the only way that law could have got the assent of the president was for the central government to agree for a special carve out for Rajasthan. Center has that power to allow for a carve out if, if a state wants it. And it is again a, a sign of the times, an indication of shifting uh, power equations in India between the center and the states that the government of India endorsed the amendments made by the Rajasthan. So Rajasthan now has, is perhaps the only state which now has uh, much eased labor laws compared to the rest of the country. So this is the second point I wish to make that not only are the states asserting their right to have more say in how their states are run, but equally significantly the central government is willing to, uh, is there something? The central government is uh, willing to uh, allow states to assert this. This also should, in the long run, make, uh, in the medium run, make doing business in India and some states much easier. Certainly, labor law compliance in Rajasthan today is a lot easier than it is anywhere else in the country. The third significant development that I need to talk about, that I want to talk about, is the report of the 14th Finance Commission, which actually makes a tectonic shift in the resources between the center and the states. So, so far, uh, most finance commissions, up to the 13th Finance Commissions, had recommended that 30% between 29 and 32 percent, that is the range, uh, of the net collections of the, of the center be uh, transferred to the states, and then there was, there was, of course, distribution amongst the state of that money by a formula. 
The 13th Finance Commission, the last Finance Commission, whose period ended on 31st March 2015, had recommended transfer of 32 percent of the resources to the states. The 14th Finance Commission has recommended the transfer of 42 percent of the revenues to the states. So that's a huge jump, and suddenly the states have much more untied money. There is no, obviously the money is the same pool, but who has control over spending it? That paradigm has changed. So that paradigm has changed, and states will therefore have more say in spending the resources. If we take the, all the tax resources of the country as a whole, both the uh, central taxes and the state taxes, and combine them and see, because states get to retain their own taxes, they don't share those, and the, only the central pool is shared. So if you combine the two tax sources and see how much of the taxation resource is now retained by the states, it's about 62%. So two-thirds of the fiscal resources of the country are going to be with the states. Now, this uh, development has to be seen uh, also uh, as coincidental to and in the context of the fourth development, which is actually a kind of obverse of this development of the Finance Commission, which is the winding up of what we used to know as the Planning Commission. No, I will not go into that because that's a story of socialism and command and control economy, which I hope we have given up as a bad dream forever. But uh, uh, that, uh, but the recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission are actually a very important step in not only empowering the states, but also finally burying the ghost of their command and control economy. So we don't have a planning commission in, the, in, the, in India anymore, and uh, we don't have any uh, set pattern or command or targets to achieve in terms of development, et cetera, whatever the planning commission was supposed to do. Now, this, the three important developments that I talked about, the likelihood of there being a GST, the likelihood of more and more states making laws which are not consistent with central laws, and therefore perhaps not as moribund as them. The well, central government has more difficulty in changing laws because it needs consensus building amongst the states, but the state has to only decide for itself. So second development of perhaps laws becoming more friendly, more welcoming uh, to the investors, that perhaps that trend, I hope that trend has started with Rajasthan, and I hope it continues. I am told that as we stand today here, Rajasthan has now uh, finally passed some amendments to the right to education bill also, and they are on their way to Government of India for approval. So that is the uh, second important development. And the third important development is that the states have a lot more financial resources at their command to spend as they wish. Now what does this mean? So I said I will link it to investment and investors. So what does this mean and imply? I have said broadly what GST can mean for investment. I have also said that labor, uh, labor laws, et cetera, are, uh, uh, can be eased by the state governments without waiting, waiting for the central government's uh, elephant to move. And that the financial powers give states more assertiveness. So what does it mean for the investor? Investor, in India, if you're going to invest, then one thing that we have to realize that we have to deal with two different governments. There is an effort by the government of India in the Ministry or Department of Industrial Promotion to try to create a platform, IT platform, which is actually very well done, which will get the state governments and the central government to give as many clearances as possible in, through that one window. But still, while entering India, you largely deal with the government of India but once you've entered and invested, because you have to build a factory or you have to run a factory or a business or a, uh, some, some business you have to run within that, that business is situated in, this, in one of the states. And then once you are in there, then you will deal largely with the state governments. So this we have to reckon with and recognize. And 
these developments that have taken place on the financial economic front are consistent with developments that have taken place in the last 30 years, political developments that have taken place in the last 30 years, where political power has gradually shifted to the states. So states are going to be meaningful for all investors. And I think that is a very positive development for investors in India, whether they are domestic or foreign. It's a very positive development because state governments are smaller governments and therefore they are easy to navigate. In my opinion, they are easy to navigate and uh, easy to understand, easy to approach people who can take decisions as opposed to central government where decision making can be very, very disparate. So uh, I think it is uh, going to be, it's a very good development that is happening. The state governments will be able to take more decisions. They are capable of taking quicker decisions because they are a smaller government. They are capable of being more flexible. They are more, uh, they can be quicker and faster. Secondly, and more importantly, state governments actually understand the importance of investment much more than center does. For the center, the benefit is somewhat intangible in terms of GDP growth, foreign exchange reserves, etc. For the states, the, 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 the outcome is very, very tangible. A factory comes up, people get employed, shops come outside the factories, the trucks, number of trucks increases. So the benefit of the states can be seen in a much more tangible fashion. As a result, it is also my conviction that states are much more investor friendly than the center is. And therefore, it's also my conviction that uh, basically, not that center is unfriendly, but center is not capable of helping beyond a point. It can ease your entry into India, but beyond that, it's the state government which has to, uh, which, which you have to survive. And state governments do realize the value of investment. And I'm sure that many of the friends here who have gone and interacted with the state government, especially if they've gone to states like Gujarat or Maharashtra or Karnataka, would have found the response to be extremely positive, friendly, and quick. So this is the major development that uh, I wanted to talk to you about today. I hope I haven't bored you. And uh, well, even if I have, I can only apologize. But uh, I stand here, and I'll take a few questions if somebody is interested. Thank you. When you increase the amount that the states are going to get, does the center kind of tell them what they can spend it on, or can they do anything they want with it? No, once the, that's the, see, the, that is the whole issue, that the planning commission uh, used to run things called the centrally sponsored schemes on items which are in the state list. There they could direct what the money was spent on. And states had been clamoring now for many, many years that we don't want to be directed by the center on how we handle our problems. So we know what our state's requirements are. So for example, there was a, there was a scheme on roads called the Pradhan Mantri Gramin Sadak Yojana, which Rajasthan took huge advantage of, but Gujarat couldn't, because Gujarat had all the roads in the world already, all the roads they wanted. So basically this inequity of making centrally sponsored schemes on a one-size-fits-all approach is what the states have been opposing and asking for untied money. Devolution is untied money. So once the money devolves, then as a tax devolution under the Finance Commission, then the center has no say on how it is spent. No legal say. There can be other ways of uh, trying to arm twist the states, but there's no legal say. <laughs> I have one other short question, you know. Here in the United States, when we do work for the federal government, okay, uh, and I invoice them, they have to pay me in 30 days, or they pay interest automatically. Okay, do you have any such plans in India? No, we don't. Uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, no law which governs it. But naturally, that's one of the areas of concern that we are well aware of: delayed payments and the corruption that arises as a consequence. And therefore, in, a, in, the, in, the, 
current budget, Finance Minister Jaitley has announced that he would be enacting a law on public procurement that should ought to cover this. I think when I talk to investors, uh, both in the U.S. and in India, there is a concern about the uncertainty of the tax regime in India. So as Kiran and I were discussing earlier today, more and more Indian companies are thinking of moving their intellectual property and their operations outside India, and many U.S. companies are reluctant to have any activities in India that would be perceived as activities that some tax person might treat as effective control. So the end result is uncertainty of taxes. Is there any thinking about how to streamline that, not just in policy, but in the text of the regulation so that companies that are in this room and companies in India are much more strongly incented to, uh, to invest and keep the investment in India? One of the remarks I made uh, in, my, oh, in my presentation to you was that uh, GST should make tax regime more predictable insofar as indirect taxes are concerned. So that uh, should cover it. Of course, the major worry still comes from direct taxes, which is a tax on income. It comes from the recent, recent imposition of MAT on certain FIIs, etc. So we are, uh, you know, the problem exists, one can't deny it. And since we have recognized the problem, I'm sure that uh, that's the first step towards finding a solution to it. And I think in all fairness, I can say that uh, this government has been rather serious and rather sincere about uh, not having what we, in India we call tax terrorism. So, uh, so therefore, it, it sort of... Uh, put its, uh, you know, uh, put where its, mother, its mother where its words are, because it actually uh, didn't appeal the, for example, the Vodafone case in the Supreme Court. And it has, uh, uh, Finance Minister Jaitley has announced on the floor of the House that he has no intentions of uh, ever using the tax, the retrospective tax pro uh, 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 provisions that exist in law. Having said that, uh, this is not the easiest of things to do, as you can appreciate, because uh, changing uh, the structure of tax laws in any country can be quite challenging. But I can only say that uh, the policymakers are aware of the problems. There is, an there is tension within the, within the central government on how to achieve this end which is a good sign again, because it means there's thinking going on, there are views being put on table, and I'm, I hope that sooner rather than later, we'll come out uh, with uh, a solution which makes tax regimes more predictable. The last thing on this is that we are also uh, willing to sign, and we have offered it to the United States also, we are now currently in talks with Canada, sign bilateral investment treaties which can cover some of the uncertainty issues that arise for foreign investors. So bilateral investment treaties we are open to signing. We have a text on our website which is accessible to all to see and comment upon. And as of as I speak to you today, which is the last day of our negotiations with Canada, we don't have a deal as yet, but I'm sure sooner or later we'll have a deal with them. But we have had two, three rounds of negotiations. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. My name is Susan Finston, and I've been a consultant in Washington, D.C., and also work uh, with pharma industry, in fact, also consulting for Wadwani Foundation on MSME innovation for creation of social and economic value through entrepreneurship. So building on the tax question uh, that was just asked by, by Ramesh Wadwani, there are two areas specifically when you're looking at Indian tax policy that can provide incentives for entrepreneurship and for creation of social and economic value where I believe India could draw from the U.S. and other examples. The first is that right now high net worth individuals have disincentives to invest and become like angel investors 
or to contribute to the growth of high technology because there's no tax credit system. In fact, the incentives run against for high net worth individuals. And if you're looking at tax policy, I think looking at the policy that can incentivize investment instead of, as, as was said, the removal or offshoring. And the second is for the MSMEs themselves that face a very high tax burden proportionate to the value they can create if they also get tax breaks as in the US and other OECD level countries. If an entrepreneur has to look at paying such a high level of tax on everything, whether it's GST or otherwise, and also there's no tax incentive for investment, then it, it's a very high you know, hurdle to clear just to consider that sometimes I feel as though MSMEs pay more proportionately in taxes than bigger companies that get very good tax advice. So if it's possible to look at the high end and the low end and carve out tax policies to encourage entrepreneurship, and encourage high net worth individuals to go into this angel investing, as we've seen in other countries, that could unlock tremendous resources that the government wouldn't have to bear for support of growth of high technology and biotechnology entrepreneurship. Sorry for that being so long. Okay, by making the answer short. Uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, for on the taxation principle, whether it should be resident, residence-based or business-based, is also an ongoing debate in India. and. Your issue of angel investors emanates from that. I think some steps have been taken this time in the budget because we have announced tax reliefs for uh, collective investment schemes, including for foreign investment, and for uh, also as for uh, investment trusts and real estate trusts. So I am not the uh, uh, tax expert, but there are reliefs there. Kindly have a look, and if you need any clarifications, if you bung in an email, I'd be happy to respond to it. Regarding MSMEs, the question is more complex because actually uh, what has happened is a strange, the outcome of an honest effort has been uh, unfortunate because they kept giving carve outs to MSMEs, and that has created another uh, issue that they don't get, therefore, tax credits when they actually sell, because their sales are exempt from tax. So the, the real trick here is to get them back into the tax system so they're able to get tax credit on their purchases. You know, and hopefully that will happen if uh, GST is implemented. So again, uh, I admit that MSMEs have an issue right now, and uh, it would be their interest to realize that they are better off uh, in the tax system of the GST than outside it, because outside it they get no credit for the tax they pay on their purchases, whether it's direct or indirect. So thank you so much. Thank you once again for having me. And uh, I hope that uh, I, have you, I have inspired some of you to come and invest in India. Thank you. <laughs> so when's the last time you had a tax conversation and laughed that much? Um, so pretty, pretty unusual character. But as we all know, tax is one of the things that keeps CEOs up at night. You know, more than most of the stuff that I think that makes up a government affairs uh, conversation. So it is an important conversation to have when we talk about the, uh, the environment. So Secretary Marishi, uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming and, and, and sharing those thoughts. So uh, right now we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to switch over to the, uh, to the skills panel. So if the panelists could please uh, come and join me on stage and, and we'll continue on. But thank you again, Secretary.
Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One you want? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stay here because I don't want to walk all the way across. Yep. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. Uh, I think that was a pretty interesting conversation by the uh, by the finance secretary and a good setup for the programs we're going to have uh, ongoing throughout the day. So now we're going to begin um, three panel discussions: one before lunch, which is going to talk about skills development, and then we'll have two panels after lunch as well. Uh, the first one uh, looking at uh, India's uh, concept of smart cities and how the United States can contribute to that and then wrapping up with the final panel on Make in India. So investors looking at this Make in India campaign to see whether or not um, there really is a, a, a lot that can be accomplished through that. Um, so a variety of companies that have invested will invest, uh, and also our good friend uh, Jay Panda, member of parliament from ERISA, um, talking from his vantage point as well on what the Make in India campaign looks like from the state level. So uh, it's a little intimidating uh, to, to be up here because of course uh, one of my own gurus from my beginning in the 1990s in doing US India, Tarun Das um, is uh, joining me on stage. I think uh, most of you, I'm sure, uh, have run across Tarun at some point. Um, uh, Dr. Ajay Kella, uh, who is the CEO of the Wadwani Foundation, and so a very important person in my life, uh, in my role here at, uh, at CSIS. Um, and, uh, and, and a new person for me to meet as well, uh, Gwen Copsey, who's Vice President for International Strategic Partnerships at Boeing. Um, so meeting with the Boeing team and talking about the conference, and it was interesting that this was the panel that they really had an interest in because, you know, you, you think, oh, it's going to be defense sales and offsets and that kind of stuff, but, but actually it's a company that's very interested and keen on skills development, so it's really a treat, Gwen, to have you up here as well. So appreciate you coming over. Um, so let me start with, uh, with uh, Taran Das, if I might. Uh, and I think it is three great perspectives. I mean, Taran with a terrific perspective, having run CII, having taken a leadership role in Ananta Center, um, on, on you know, how we look at skills and where the gaps are and, and, and what companies, what individuals, what governments are doing to try to fill that. So, uh, so Taran, uh, let me lead off with you. I know we're very much interested in hearing you okay. know, your thoughts on this great topic. Okay, I'll just make um, five points, Rick, and thank you for having me here. One is the history of skills development in India, and just in a couple of lines, um, it was completely government for a long, long time. There was something, there was a structure of something called industrial training institutes. We call them ITIs for short. And that is where skills training took place around the country, uh, managed by the Ministry for Labor, and private sector was not in the game. All right. If private sector was in the game, it was only doing skills training for their captive needs, for their in-company needs. All right. So that's the history. When Dr. Manmohan Singh was prime minister, actually in that government, they started worrying about this whole skills issue. And I had the privilege of chairing the first government task force on skills development. You know, nobody really looked at <laughs> skills <laughs> development as a policy, as a strategy. It was happening, and then somebody realized that, you know, maybe things were not going right for us. And we had all this demographic dividend, which could be a demographic disaster. Right? And this task force 
we had private sector CEOs on it, as well as government people, came out and said, the private sector has a major role in skills development. So we need to move the ball out of the government and look at private sector's role, look at public-private partnerships, and how to take this forward in a different paradigm altogether. Right? Point two. Point three, the National Skills Development Corporation was then set up by the government as a public-private partnership corporation. 51% with the private sector. So control with the private sector, 49% funding from the government. And this corporation, the NSDC, which is headed by one of my former deputies, Dilip Chinoy, uh, who right now, I mean, he could be here today, but he's with the prime minister in Canada. He's signing MOUs with community colleges in, in Canada. Uh, for skills development programs to be launched in India. Um, this has become the central agency in the country to drive skills development. But it is working essentially with the private sector, which is new to the game. So it needs a little bit of support, infrastructure, maybe funding, and, and it is led to, in the last few years, several hundred private sector companies coming into skills development, actually as a business. It's not charity. Hmm. As a business. So I wanted you to name, understand this evolution. And then more recently, in this government, uh, Mr. Modi has set up a ministry for skills and entrepreneurship. So he has a cabinet minister heading that, a young cabinet minister. And what he's done is every single ministry was dealing with skills for their own areas. Okay, The health ministry, the education ministry, the civil aviation ministry, and it was chaotic. It was like anarchy. You know? Everything has been collapsed into one place. It's now coordinated and driven through the Ministry of Skills working with the National Skills Development Corporation. That's the government structure. Now I want to talk about the last two points, is about the US and India and skills development. And I know Ajay will talk about what they're doing, and uh, Ramesh Vadwani referred to that in his opening remarks this morning. I see skills development as a huge business opportunity for US companies. So it's, one is for companies doing business there, needing the right kind of people, and training them and all of that. So that'll be the Boeings and many other companies. But forget them. You have amazing firms here who do training work. Across the country, you've got an infrastructure of firms who train people. And if you just see websites and you see the internet, you see how many firms there are. What I'm saying is you have a business opportunity in India. You don't need to take on all 500 million people. <laughs> Why don't you just take on a million? You want to train a million people and make money at it? It's there. So a business opportunity in India is not only about products. It's, this is a product of a different kind. This is a human resources capacity building product, which you can provide, and the market is there. It's a 500 million plus market who we are trying to skill and train. And the National Skills Development Corporation is driving this, working with private sector companies. So your private sector companies want to come in there and work. The, Make a beeline for the National Skills Development Corporation, connect with them, and find that there is a market and there is support. You know, there's actually financing support available to help you to get into the market of human resources capacity building. So I wanted to bring this different dimension into the conversation today. The next point is, apart from the size of the market, 
this is going to be a continuing market. This is a long-term market. This is not going away, you know. It's, this is not about buying uh, 30 aircraft or something. And, you know, then depending on after-sales service or spare parts or whatever, human beings in India have got to be trained for the next 100 years. We, we better start using you know? other than aircraft for <laughs> yeah. the panel here since we've got an expert. So, so. I'm <laughs> looking at her. So she's going to come in. and you know. yeah. But what I'm saying is that this is a continuing market forever. And because we have hundreds of millions of young people who need training, who need development, th there it is. You know, it, it shows you the size of the market. I'm not sure whether in the US, skills development is seen like that, you know, as far as India is concerned. Is it seen as a market? Is it seen as a long-term market? And then, if you take what Mr. Maharishi said just now, forget the whole of India. Take one state. In one state, you have to train a million or a couple of million people. Just work with one chief minister, one state government, and focus. So one company or two companies can go in there and say, I will work with Rajasthan. They've got great labor laws. They've changed everything. They've got a great investor-friendly administration. The chief minister is very pro working with the US. I will go and work with them. And the National Skills Development Corporation will give me backup. So give you confidence, hand-holding, and get into the market and focus on one geographical area in India, not necessarily look at you know, the whole of India. I feel, and this is my last point, your smaller firms who are hesitant about India, because it's tough to do business there, it's complicated. But this is green field. There are no regulations. There are no regulations. You can go and, and the cost, the low, the, the commitment of money is nothing. You, know? you don't have to build a building now until you make your millions. Uh, you don't have to invest in fixed assets. You can rent space. You can rent, so it's a low cost operation. There are margins there, and smaller firms in the US, in the services sector, who are providing training to people here, can actually look at that country, look at India as a very good market. So it's, it's a way of also getting into that market at an SME level, mm -hmm. not necessarily just the big corporations. Thank you. Good, great, thank you, Taran. Well, um, since you wrapped up mostly looking at uh, um, at the private sector, then maybe Gwen, I'll transition to you since as a private sector player here and how you look at uh, the skills development uh, market in India. So if I can turn it over to you to okay, to follow sure, up. and I'm going to yeah. step down here and Perfect. use the podium. Yeah, great. Well, that's a good thing because I lost my guy. Oh, I think I'm good. Can you still hear me? All right, good. Well, let's see. When we look at India, you know, India stands today as the world's largest importer of defense equipment. Indian's government, under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, and you've heard a lot about this this morning, has realized the importance of reversing this trend with initiatives such as uh, Make in India, expected to provide further support to locally manufacture uh, and assembly defense equipment. This effort is more than just an aspiration. India has both the capabilities and the government support to transform the country into a net exporter of military hardware. And as we consider India's ambitious path, we have to consider a few factors that will be important along the way. Now first, we realize that India is a late entrant to the export-led manufacturing model that has transformed economies around the world like China and other Southeast Asian countries in earlier decades. India has seemingly skipped from manufacturing as the economy transitioned from agricultural to services, but is quickly gaining capabilities and momentum in the manufacturing sector. Second, we have to take into account the consideration, the necessary conditions to grow domestic defense manufacturing, including sound infrastructure, predictable tax policies, as we talked about earlier today, uh, pragmatic labor laws, and government incentives. And above all, However, it's the availability of the skilled manpower that is the most important enabler, because without it, India cannot sustain a competitive defense industrial base. 
So for aerospace and defense manufacturing, the required talent pool can be broadly classified into two areas. One is the engineering and the manu manufacturing and the management pool. And the second one is the frontline factory worker. For India, the talent pool in engineering and management is currently abundant in other industrial sectors and could be applied to the aerospace domain with moderate effort. The real challenge, however, is the pool of frontline factory workers. India currently does not have a large enough workforce with such skills as precision, machining, fabrication, and assembly to meet the needs of aerospace and defense companies. This shortage of talent for skilled frontline aerospace factory workers in India creates a vicious cycle of skilled capability output mismatch. The skills are in short supply, so capabilities don't grow, and as a result, the output of the Indian aerospace manufacturing sector remains stagnant. The ripple effect then takes over. A shortage of skilled workers does not attract fresh investments, which further reduces opportunities to grow skills, and it ultimately limits the significant growth in the India's aerospace and manufacturing area and defense companies. So how do we bridge this gap between what India has and what global aerospace and defense companies need? And to answer that question, we need to take a look at the progress and limitations for Indian aerospace and defense companies. Since, opening, since the opening of India's defense sector in 2001, we are see, seeing private companies showing interest and participating in aerospace manufacturing. Unfortunately, the effects of the sector being closed to foreign investment for so long still does exist. Both public and private sector manufacturers have gaps in their aerospace manufacturing skills because Indian companies simply were not exposed to the global aerospace and defense manufacturing requirements. Now, Indian companies are increasingly gathering the skills to manufacture specific work packages for major companies like Boeing and others. But those skills are specific to that project that that company is working on. That limits true skills infusion that would enable a company, an Indian company, to grow and compete for more diverse and complex work in the future. Certain Indian companies have invested in their own aerospace manufacturing sales and their skills development infrastructure in the form of labs, equipment, curriculum, and trainers. However, many of the emerging micro, small, and medium enterprise uh, companies simply cannot afford to make such investments. And further complicating matters is that there isn't a single agency in India that can authorize, at this time, an aerospace manufacturing curriculum and provide industry-recognized certifications. And while some may hope that increasing the foreign direct investment limit would encourage foreign companies to help overcome the challenge that many may not, that may not be the case. Foreign companies may be reluctant to make such investments given the reality of current skill levels and the length of time it requires to scale up. So I'm going to return to that question. How do we bridge the gap between what Indian companies have and what global aerospace and defense companies need? One suggestion is to start with the policy design to maximize the partnership between the two between the two Indian defense offset policies. Indian offset policy can be the right tool to develop aerospace, manufacturing skills, an Indian industrial base, and break the vicious cycle. The Indian defense offset policy was first published in 2005 and mandates a minimum of the foreign companies to invest 30% of the value of the products that they sell back into India. And the policy has undergone several revisions since 2005 to help further enable the development of the Indian defense industry. One of the stated objectives of the defense offset policy is to, is to foster development of internationally competitive enterprises. They want to be able to export out of India and have a robust defense market. However, the policy does not currently encourage or prioritize the imparting of skills to Indian companies. So changes to the policy that would provide foreign companies with the necessary incentives to invest in the skill development infrastructure of the country could help bridge the gap. And as the skills development infrastructure grows from both foreign company involvement and skills development and establishment of industry recognized certification, India companies of all sizes will have an opportunity to get the necessary training and certifications. As the cycle of skill capability output is broken, foreign aerospace and defense companies will have further incentives to incorporate Indian companies into their global supply chains as capabilities go up and the risk of execution go down. 
All in all, this would result in what we call a win-win for all stakeholders, the government of India, certainly Indian industry, and the foreign aerospace and defense companies, because we're able to add significant value to our supply chain by these very capable Indian companies. So with that, that concludes my remarks. Great. Thanks, Grant. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a new, new angle, I think, to take a look at, uh, at offsets. I, I've heard you know, a variety mm -hmm. of industries talk about these dollars generated through offset requirements as uh, plugging this hole and that hole, and sometimes it's a, a tenuous grasp at best uh, to what the purpose of an offset policy is, but to actually provide the education and tools for Indian uh, manufacturers to get up to speed, I think, is a, is a pretty novel, uh, novel thought along those lines. Um, so we, we've taken a look at what government has done, what private sector has done, and of course with the foundation, it starts with a number, getting so many people into jobs rather than kind of building it up from the business side. So Ajay, can you sort of walk us through you know, the foundation and how they approach this idea of getting people into jobs and the role that skills plays in doing so? Okay, so i will happy to do that. Good, good morning to everybody. and. Uh, it was at the break I was told that I need to be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ramesh had a crisis with one of his companies. Uh, he runs 23 companies, so there's always a crisis, but one of them happened to be right now. <laughs> and uh, since, uh, since, since his companies generate most of the wealth that I get to spend, I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to substitute for him. Um, so let me talk about the skill gap. Uh, why is skill talked about globally today. Uh, so let's start at the top and then I'll talk about what is it that we at the foundation are, are doing as well as what are the other organizations on the, in India that are doing on skilling. So today the skill gap is a global phenomenon. Uh, what academia is producing and what industry wants, there is a huge, huge delta. Uh, and that's reflected in what's happening. If you look at India today, even the IT industry, where the Indian, in the Indian software engineers are, are rated the highest, uh, NASCOM, which is an um, um, industry body, um, they did a recent study on the graduates that are coming out of Indian en engineering organization, and 80% of them are unemployable. So they don't have the talent that there is. So if you look at uh, Infosys, which is one of the largest uh, Indian IT companies, they've set up a large campus in Mysore, uh, where they pre-hire students, uh, 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 they hire students on graduation, they put them in a one-year training program before they uh, engage them in, uh, in jobs. Uh, also on the US side, even developed econo economies have a problem with uh, the skill gap today. Uh, about three years ago when we were looking at data, and, and the reflection of a skill gap is really, uh, it shows up in youth unemployment, because these are students that are graduating and they are not employable. Uh, three years ago when we looked at the US data, there, there were about eight, overall unemployment was somewhere around 8%, youth unemployment was 16%, and youth between 16 and 19, was close to 24%. At that time, about 4 million jobs were open in the US, and 60% of the employers were complaining that they can't find the talent to fill the jobs. So I think you have talked about that as well. Uh, uh, so that, that phenomena exists today. In fact, now, if you look at the data today, the unemployment rate in US has gone down to 5%, but still, uh, the youth unemployment is 3x, and the open jobs have gone up from 4 million to close to 6 million. So another reflection that it's the skill gap that is causing the issue. Um, so about three years ago, we as a foundation said, what can we do in this area? Uh, and since we were focused in India, we started in India uh, with the skill. Uh, it's a massive problem. India is adding about a million people a month to the workforce. So every, essentially every month, about a million youth are turning 18 and are entering the workforce, or, or they are going to colleges. So there's, there is a massive demand. Um, 
When we looked at the entire skill pyramid, we found that uh, if you looked at an 18-year-old that's graduating 12th grade, about 9 million students graduate 12th grade uh, in India. About 4 million go to these three-year, four-year colleges that are existing. Four and a half million students are left behind. Uh, and in this day and age, uh, 12th grade education with a knowledge economy taking shape, a 12th grade education is not enough. The new K-12 is really the new K-14. I think President Obama also recently talked about uh, making community colleges uh, free in the, uh, in, in the US. Uh, and India has nothing, really. Uh, so there is a 12th grade, and then there is uh, college education. So in between, there is a huge gap. And this is what I think Tarun and uh, others had looked at the problem and set up the National Skill Development Corporation. Um, we as a foundation as a, are an operating foundation. Most of us have spent time in the valley, so we, we wanted to bring in technology innovation to scale to address this problem. Uh, so what we are doing is, uh, so we targeted 12th graders that are not going to college. Uh, and for them, in, in US, uh, if you look at the similar data, 25% of US graduates go to four-year colleges. I think some of you will be shocked by that number, but the number really is only 25% of US graduates go to four-year colleges. About 46% go to community colleges which are the two-year program. So the community college model in the US was a very good model. Uh, just like Tarun talked about, US training industry can have an opportunity to go to India and train the 500 million youth that we are talking about. US community colleges have an opportunity to set up community colleges in the US because there is a huge gap. Uh, so we pushed that idea uh, with the government of India. At that time, it was Manmohan Singh's government. And we got good traction even there. Uh, and what has resulted in there is the, they have put in a legislation now where, uh, where there will be uh, uh, recognition of skills and training. Uh, set, they are setting up equivalent of community colleges which will have upward mobility into the four-year college, so it's not a dead-end stream. Uh, the Indian government has now funded about 400 community colleges as a pilot uh, and are collaborating with foreign governments. Tarun talked about uh, Prime Minister Modi is in Canada now signing up uh, agreement with the, with the Canadian community colleges. So, so you know, we had originated and started this with US. Uh, and we are finding US community colleges not as aggressively pushing. In fact, Canada and Germany and Australia have jumped onto this bandwagon. US has not. Uh, so it's an opportunity in the US to jump onto this. Coming back to the foundation, while these colleges are getting set up, uh, I, I think we cannot wait for these infrastructure to come in place. You know, if we go back to the brick and mortar model of educating that large population, uh, it will take decades, if not half a century. So we, as a foundation, said, why don't we leverage technology to impart this? So the foundation focus has now shifted from sort of setting this mechanism in place to investing in what we call the soft infrastructure. The soft infrastructure essentially is creating uh, pedagogy, creating uh, learning modules. Today, how many of you, when you're stuck trying to learn something, go to YouTube and watch videos? Show of hands. Uh, Not bad. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we are trying to do, essentially, is to transform. So uh, the way we started this as a pilot, actually, we are doing this both in the US as well as in India. Let me talk about India. Uh, India has about 1.2 billion people, as you know. 
uh, health care is a major issue. Uh, um, nurses and nursing assistant, there is a demand for somewhere around a million nursing assistant in the next five years. Uh, you don't need a college degree for that. You can take a 12th grader, put them through a one year or an 18 month program and they can become nursing assistants, earning family supporting wages. Uh, in the absence of community colleges in their industry was doing that job. So we went to the industry and said, give us the content that you have. Uh, this is really not your job of training. Your job is to take care of the patients. We will work with us, we will transform your content, which is very teacher-centric and non-scalable, and transform it into videos, animation, and gaming, and offer it through the cloud to everybody in the industry. Uh, so about 18 months ago, we worked with one of the hospital chains. Today, we are working across five big hospital chains, about hundreds of hospitals that have adopted this program. Similarly, on hospitality, we are doing the same thing. Uh, and we are now entered into an agreement with the defense industry. Uh, defense industry needs a lot of you know, support. All the equipment that you are importing from defense need to be maintained and managed. So we are building up those, uh, those uh, uh, platforms. So essentially, long story short, the investment uh, in skilling can sort of only happen through leveraging modern technology to address the problem at scale. Uh, and that's what we are trying to achieve. Oh, terrific, Ajay. Thank you. Great. Um, we, we've got a few minutes for questions. And I, I want to start off, you know, one thing that I've learned, I think, most of all, by getting to uh, uh, shadow uh, Tarun over the years is uh, cutting to the chase and knowing what is the flash and what is the substance. So one issue on education that I think captures a lot of attention here, which we didn't talk as much about, is American four-year universities. And is there a role they can play in contributing to skills and education in India? And this bill comes through and it hasn't passed yet about allowing foreign investment in universities. Is that a game changer? Is it not? Some schools don't like campuses overseas. You know, what's been your experience? Do, do you think that there's that much of a role uh, for American four year universities to go there, set up, do things, or is it going to be you know, other models, the private sector model, community colleges? Do you have a sense on that? Uh, Rick, I think we are sending about 100,000 students to American universities each year. Okay? Uh, that will only grow because the kids want to come to America to study. All right? It's not just studying in an American university. In India, if there was a campus there, it is the whole experience of being here, being on campus, you know, all of that, international students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's one point. I think they, the drive, that, he, that, that hunger to come here to study is not going to come down. It's going to just grow, grow and grow and grow. It will, we'll have to see your university's capacity to take uh, more and more kids coming, you mm -hmm. know, depending on size of classes and all of that. Second, what I have seen in my conversations with uh, American universities is that they are able to set up a small center in India, but they don't have resources to go big time into setting up in India, you know. So they need then an Indian partner or, or, a, or a partner who will provide funds for, for doing that. You know, so private universities are happening in India now. Uh, there's one great example of the Ashoka University uh, near Delhi, which is uh, funded by private sector uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, they have collaborations with individual universities for different disciplines. So in a way, you're transferring the teaching and the know-how, mm -hmm. but you and you're getting paid for it. Again, it's like a business opportunity, which is great for the university, but it is not an investment by the university okay. in terms of money going out, because you need the money here. And I think after the financial crash in 2008, I think a lot of universities' endowments, you know, were impacted big time. So my sense is. Um, There'll be different 
ways that universities will get involved there. A lot of it is to recruit students to come here, <laughs> actually. It's a marketing office. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a liaison come marketing office. But as Ajay mentioned, community colleges are still not seeing the business opportunity in India. Today, the Prime Minister's team will sign up with 16 Canadian community colleges, 16 today, in Ottawa. The National Skill Development Corporation CEO is coming here tomorrow for other meetings. And he was telling me that he will sign two agreements with two community colleges, one in Austin, Texas, and one somewhere else. But it's like, you know, more the exception than the rule. So I think we have some work to do here in opening the business opportunity to community colleges. It is a business opportunity, as I said. It, it's not charity and all that. And people like Ajay and all who are here and the Badwani Foundation can actually be very helpful in this process. Um, you know, Gwen, India is not the first country on Earth to take a look at aerospace and think, I'm going to be the next big aerospace player. Um, you know, talking about trying to help workers get the skills to be able to, to, to do that, H have you seen a country? that has committed itself to you know, really kind of imparting the sort of education in a relatively short period of time to become competitive? Or is India perhaps trotting a bit of new ground if they're successful in doing this? Well, I mean, I think I'll just kind of focus on India with the answer to your question. So um, I mean, our experience in India with, with working with the industry there, and we do have quite a few industry partners that we work with, um, is that they do have that requirement for employees to have certain skills. Mm -hmm. And so what we've found, and we've invested millions of dollars in India with uh, people that are helped to develop supply chains, help provide skills on program management, uh, help provide some of the technical skills on the trades, et cetera. Um, and, but we've typically done it based on where we're sourcing the work. So we do it on a company by company basis, depend upon their needs. And that certainly is one way to get there. But it's not the way to get there probably the fastest mm -hmm. that you would want to get. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I absolutely agree with a lot of what you two gentlemen are saying here about how you need this more broader focus. Uh, and I'm, and I'm going to speak specifically for aerospace and defense mm -hmm. because you know, I'm part of the Boeing company, and that's what we're interested in. And I think it's, 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 it's encouraging having a, a model that encourages companies that are in India for the long term, which the Boeing company certainly is. We've been involved in India for a long term, certainly on the commercial side, more recently on the defense side. But there has to be uh, an encouragement and an incentive for us to, to do uh, more broad training and development and certifications for this kind of skills that are necessary um, for uh, like a, whether it's a sheet metal worker, an assembly, a person that does assembly, uh, quality, you know, quality management, all those kinds of things that are inherent in the certifications that you need to get for aerospace. And I would say the companies that, or the countries that have done it well, is a lot of what they do is they do encourage it through their policy and through some other offset policies as well. It encourages uh, and recognizes the importance of skills development as they look at uh, projects that would be acceptable uh, for, um, for defense offset. And that's something that I believe you know, and I'm touched on a little bit, is that's one of the policy changes I think that we need to look at in the future. And, and India has done a tremendous job at continuing to enhance their policy on defense so that it really benefits and achieves the objectives and the vision for more make in India and growing that defense industry. But I don't think right now it, it really incentivizes companies to do a more broad reach across multiple companies who they maybe aren't even going to be working with directly but maybe their supply chain could or other competitors, it doesn't currently recognize that in a way that encourages people to do it for the broader base. We'll do it for the companies we're working with and we're doing that, right. but that's gonna be a step-by-step -step approach yeah. and that won't get it, you won't get it done as quickly as you would like in terms of you know, the vision that you'd have for the country to really grow their defense industry. Mm. Uh, well, one more question from my side and then I'll open it up uh, and for, for Ajay. So, 
Um, I've, I've seen it a number of times over the years. Uh, an American organization, whether it's a company or a foundation, uh, comes to India and says, I'm here to help. And even though it has strong India roots already, uh, what's the receptivity been? I mean, obviously, you're coming only to help. Um, and, and what's the receptivity been at the center and state level when you say that you want to do this? Are they willing to open up and partner with you? Did it take a while? Because like, that's one thing that turns, again, whether it's companies or foundations, turns people off with India sometimes is they don't see that responsiveness. So what's been your engagement with government? How's that impacted things? Um, surprisingly, quite well. Uh, I think, uh, but it's not Silicon Valley standards either. <laughs> <laughs> or it's not even business standards. It takes a while. Uh, the, mission, the mission of the bureaucrats and ministers is, is, yes, it is to do good, but at the end of the day also it's the vote banks and chasing that. So there is, sometimes there is conflict. But just to give you an example, right, we, we started working with the Indian government only three years ago. Mm. Uh, on the skill development side, and one of the other initiatives we have is on entrepreneurship. Uh, to give you a flavor on skills development, A, we were able to put in this policy uh, working. There was something in the pipeline anyway, but it helped put in place uh, the vocational education skill development as recognized in upward mobility. They have funded 400 colleges. Today, we have taken our online skilling into 1,000 schools uh, around four states in India. Um, just last month, we signed an MOU. So now, now we are at a stage where we have done 1,000 schools, uh, 1,000 high schools, and 400 community colleges at the, at the various state level. Uh, and our, one of our other initiatives is entrepreneurship. We've been doing that for 10 years. The idea there is to take a college student and inspire and educate them to become entrepreneurs because we can't rely on the Tatas and Birlas to create companies. We want our students to start creating companies. Um, uh, and that, that is happening. Uh, so today, the foundation is doing somewhere around uh, uh, working through 500 institutes in India and they are, uh, our students are creating 1,000 companies on graduation every year. Uh, each of them, them create about uh, 10 jobs. So it's about 1,000 companies creating 10 jobs is 10,000 jobs. It doesn't have an impact on a million jobs a month. So we were looking at taking what we had built over 10 years on entrepreneurship, over three years on vocational education, and scale it 10x and 100x. Uh, so the Ministry of Skills and Entrepreneurship, as an example, signed an MOU with us to take what we have developed and scale it from the 1,000 colleges that exist to 50,000 colleges. All they need to do is sort of come in and say, OK, vocational education is a requirement every school. We have the soft infrastructure in place to deliver the content. Uh, so that's an example. Similarly, on entrepreneurship, we, are, we had signed an agreement to take uh, from, from our 500 colleges to 5,000 colleges. So we can uh, increase the order of magnitude of entrepreneurs that are created. All of this has happened over three years. All of this has happened in two years of Modi's uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's government and one year of Modi, Modi government. With the Modi government, what we are getting energized and excited about is we are talking about taking from numbers from thousands to millions. And the problem in India is in the millions. It's not in the thousands. If you can do thousands and you're only impacting a very small segment, you're not solving the problem. Uh, so our vision has always been addressing the problem at scale through technology. And we are very hopeful we'll be able to do this. Romesh earlier talked about when he visited, he met uh, the prime minister in September visited uh, uh, in February, and we met with four ministers, and with all those four ministers, we're now signing MOUs. So things, things are moving a lot more rapidly than, than we would have expected government of India to move. I think also, I would also encourage uh, working with the states, uh, because most of this implementation happens in the states. 
Uh, so the states are far more receptive and far more eager as well. While the center sets the policies and can dole out a lot of cash, the implementation happens at the state level. And so you eventually have to work with the states. Great, great. But we've got a couple of minutes before lunch, um, and so I'll open it up to the floor to see if uh, anybody else has questions. Uh, quite a few, great, great. Well, we've got a couple of microphones coming around, so let's start on the side over here. And if you could state uh, your name and, uh, and who you represent, and then try to keep it relatively brief, please. Uh, my name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of a, a profit company called Seguero's International Group and a nonprofit called Hope for Tomorrow, all doing the same thing. Uh, I'm a USA company based here, and I come from Africa. I think we have more Indians in Africa, and even my grandson is in India, uh, taking law in India. Looking at what you have explained, I think uh, vocational training is very, very important, and that's what we are trying to do with my company in the rural areas of Africa and my organization focusing on skills training and uh, training. So ha looking at using agriculture products eh, to export to the US and other countries around the world. So what you say it is very important. So how do we make this technology or collaboration, working with countries, other countries like what you are doing, exporting to the US, exporting to India and other countries. I think technical institutions, uh, vocation is very, very important. So how can we collaborate and work together to make uh, this happen? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll just say real briefly, I mean, we don't have a trilateral dialogue that I think is quite so substantive yet on US, India, Africa, but it's talked about. And Africa clearly is one of the places that I think American companies, Indian companies, and institutions have shared strengths and shared engagement. So I think it is quite open right now and, and something that I think uh, you know, is, is ripe for discussion, but uh, really underutilized at this point. So it's a, it's a terrific message. I don't know if anybody has anything else to share on that. Obviously, the foundation's moving into Africa pretty soon, uh, more on the entrepreneurship side than the skill side at first. Actually, but, both. Uh, is it both? Okay. Yeah. And so he's going to be living this. So there you go. Yeah. You know who you're going to catch up with at lunch. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are Indian companies uh, who are setting up skill centers in Africa, people who are uh, engaged with African business in a big way. And uh, we can maybe connect you to some of them. Great. Um, yeah, up here at the front. Yeah. Please. Uh, Dave Ramaswamy, I'm a consultant. and journalist and agribusiness. Agri uh, my question is, you know, India with one third of America's land area has the same, has more arable land. And yet the Indian agriculture sector employs 65% of the population with only 13% contribution to GDP. And as a result, similar to the job growth rates in the last 10 years, the agriculture sector has grown at only 2% per year. So my question is, given the productivity gap and consequently the nutritional gaps that exist in agriculture. How do you see skill development and entrepreneurship to increase uh, the nutritional content in India as well as create a whole bunch of new food entrepreneurs? Thank you. Food entrepreneurship, interesting. I don't know. If you want to to, I'll have a crack at it. Um, I think we are going through a whole process of changing Indian agriculture. You know, small holdings, small family situations, uneconomic, low productivity, and all of that, uh, to bringing in more technology. And because the next generation do not want to work on the farms. They want to move to urban locations. They want to get into IT or financial services or whatever, you know, manufacturing maybe. So. Um, I think you will see a transformation in agriculture happening. It's a slow process because they're in the rural areas. But if you go into, say you go to a town like Gurgaon, which is just outside Delhi. It's a new, new town, township. And you go into all the malls, there are lots of malls there. The, the shop assistant is a rural kid. He has, he or she has got some elementary English knowledge, can operate the equipment there in terms of, you know, invoicing, receipts, and all of that. 
and is able to deal with the customer. So they're all being absorbed, say, into the retail sector. If you go into private hospitals, in the, again, in the same township, you'll find people have come, young people have moved out from the rural sector into jobs as you know, hospital assistants, doing administrative work, or whatever. So there's a migration taking place. And that migration is happening with training to equip them for their new jobs. It's happening right across the country. I'm only talking about Gurgaon because I live there outside Delhi and I'm, I'm familiar with it and I see it all the time. Uh, we have to raise agriculture uh, productivity, but that's a different subject. I, th I think the, the real issue is what are happening, what's happening to the people there. I think the people, the young people want to move out. So there'll be many less people dependent on agriculture as we go forward, which has happened the world over. So it, it's nothing, it just happens with technology and urbanization and all of that. What is all the smart cities all about? It, it's basically a hundred new townships in India where your catchment area, the pe boys and girls from the rural areas are going to come there. So we are going through a kind of a silent revolution in India, uh, a people migration revolution, a skills revolution, a technology revolution, because you can't deal with all the problems unless you use technology, so all of that. But I think we are, we are heading in the right direction. And there's new energy right now in India, which, which hasn't been there for many years. I think, yeah, just to add to that, uh, um, I think there are a lot of questions, so maybe I'll hold on. <laughs> we can talk offline. Sure. Well, it's just about uh, lunchtime, so we'll take uh, we'll take one or two more, depending on how long. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's start up at the uh, the front here, the third row back, uh, coming up on the other side. Yeah, terrific. Uh, my name is Ramesh Kapoor. I am a, a, a president of U.S. India Security Council at the present time. My question is, uh, 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 what is your relationship uh, with with other Indian organizations that are doing the same work? One is specific is American India Foundation. Uh, how are you partnering with them, and how are you scaling with them? Because uh, that organization is for over 10 years or 12 years now in, uh, in, in uh, uh, doing charities in India. Right. Um, so we, we are an operating foundation. We are trying to really leverage technology to scale. But simultaneously, we don't do all the work ourselves. And you talked about the America India Foundation. We have been partnering with the America India Foundation for the last three years now. One of our initiatives is, uh, is driving, mainstreaming the educated, disabled uh, into corporate jobs in India. And that's where we have used America India Foundation uh, and several other NGOs that are doing skilling at a lot. A lot of these organizations were skilling, but they weren't uh, integrating the disabled into the skilling process. So we have worked with them to integrate the disabled and are working with them. Uh, we can do this alone. So I think the key partners that we envision uh, to scale to the numbers that we are looking at uh, are the three beneficiaries, really. One is the the primary beneficiary on job creation, skill development, is the government. So government partnership is key. The uh, second beneficiary is the corporates themselves, the industry. At the end of the day, if, if the industry is getting well-trained people that they can employ from day one, uh, they are saving on their training costs. So they are actively engaged with us now, uh, sitting on the table, helping define the content, helping roll out the content. And the third beneficiary are the students themselves. Uh, and to reach them, we, will, we are using a variety of partners like the America India Foundation. Okay, we'll take one more. I see a hand, uh, Marshall, back there in the, uh, in the back. Marshall Bhutan, I just wanted to follow up on Dave Ramosamy's question to Tarun about agriculture. Um, and I agree entirely with the depiction that Tarun has given of what's happening. In fact, 
you know, the, the rural labor force is declining, labor, wa labor wages in the rural sector are going up, it's becoming, it's one of the, the drivers of change in Indian agriculture. But I wanted to, I think something was lost because I think David was pointing to uh, entrepreneurial opportunities on both, end of that, both ends of that supply chain. Uh, on the agricultural side, this is going to inevitably produce consolidation, new forms of cultivation, not, not aimed at sustainability, but at supplying food to the cities. And then along the chain, transport and logistics um, to supply food to these increasingly mega cities. And finally, uh, food production itself, food processing, food retailing, are also awaiting uh, a real revolution in Indian industry. Um, the double walla is going eventually to be a thing of the past. Uh, and Indians are already gravitating uh, to chains, mostly of Western origin, but increasingly of Indian origin. So I think the food, the whole ag to food supply chain has a tremendous opportunity and very little uh, skill development for that purpose, I think. A good point. I don't know if it needs a yeah, yeah. Nice. broad agreement, I think, from everybody up on stage here, Marshall. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Well, I hope you uh, join me in welcoming and thanking the panel for this, uh, for this start of the discussion here on skills. Um, now, clearly, there's got to be a business model for this. There is already. Companies have to look to take advantage. You know, as Gwen mentioned, you know, countries have to look at all the resources they have at their disposal, such as offset policy and things to try to foment that. And the great work, and especially that the Indian government, I think, state, center and state level, has actually been welcoming for this, which you don't always hear when we talk about India. So that's, I think, should, uh, should, should warm our hearts a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, on that discussion, a lot's happening up in Canada today. So those 16 community colleges, it? Gonna be a lot more ice hockey in India, I think, uh, in, the, in the years looking ahead. Um, so uh, right now, we're gonna break for lunch. Uh, we've got sandwiches in the back. And so uh, to that end, let me also recognize once again uh, the, the, uh, the sponsors that help make today's program uh, possible. So Corning, uh, Prudential, our good friends at uh, Taj Hotels and Tata, uh, Oracle Corporation, so thanks to them. The sandwiches are on them, as well as the, uh, the drinks after it all wraps up. Uh, and then for those uh, speakers as well, um, we've got a, a lunch on the ninth floor. So uh, if you were indicated before about joining that lunch, then uh, please see our team over at the elevators. Uh, we'll reconvene at uh, 1.15. Thank you.